So how do we lock it down? And that was the question that we at the Institute for Responsible Technology asked ourselves. We had pioneered a movement. I had worked on it for 25 years. We grew it around the world. When I started, no one was talking about the health dangers of GMOs other than three or four sentences. And I realized that they were leaving a lot on the table by, by just focusing on the environment or patenting or farmers' rights. None of the NGOs wanted to touch health. But it was the health dangers that got that moved the needle, created the tipping point. So we at IRT were used to creating new messaging for the world and creating a new movement. So that's what we're up to now, creating a new movement to protect nature now. And in order to do that, we have to focus on three targets. We need laws. Again, consumer choice isn't going to make it. We need to stabilize the understanding of the dangers of genetically engineered microbes to start with popular culture and academia. Government laws are not enough. I remember being flown to, by the government of Poland years ago to give a press conference with their Minister of Environment. I praised their country's non-GMO policies, but one week later, a pro-GMO government was voted into place. Similar thing happened in Thailand. So we can't rely on government laws alone because they can change with regime change and with special interests. We have to embed an understanding in collective consciousness that we have the responsibility to protect all living beings and all future generations. Now, fortunately, there are other movements who rely on healthy microbiomes. Regenerative agriculture, extremely important to draw down carbon, to improve the quality of crops, to renew and build our soil, which supposedly has 55 growing seasons left, to overcome the need for farmers to use any pesticides, including fungicides, herbicides, insecticides. Regenerative agriculture relies on the microbial activity in the soil to do the heavy lifting. There's interest now all over the world in regenerative agriculture. But if we start releasing microbes anywhere in the world, it could theoretically destroy the ability for soil microbes to sequester carbon, to hold water, etc., etc. Environmental conservation. There are groups that are buying up and protecting rainforests and pristine lands around the planet. But these can be wiped out if their microbiome becomes imbalanced from genetic engineering. Same with oceans. The algae in the oceans, they are really the lungs of the planet with 70% of the oxygen. They're now genetically engineering algae. There's multi-billion dollar plans to use genetically engineer, engineered algae to create biofuels. But what if that changes the metabolism of the algae in the ocean? But algae also swap genes with bacteria. So all bets are off. We don't know if we are going to be choking off the oxygen supply through the oceans. Invasive species, GMO microbes are invasive species on steroids. They multiply at fantastic rates. You can't see them, you can't recall them, and they can appear in all the ecosystems of a particular jurisdiction. Human health, we've already discussed, even national security, because someone could accidentally create a devastating biological weapon or a devastating way to destroy uh, ecosystems in our future. So we, as the, as the Institute for Responsible Technology, are reaching out to these organizations, to these movements. And if you're a member of that movement, please connect with us and allow us to provide you with educational assets so you too can also call on governments and the humanity to lock down genetically engineered microbes. Now, what's interesting is if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, one of them 
is the fact that it has alerted the world to the dangers of GM of microbes, period, whether they're genetically engineered in origin or not. I don't need to enter that debate because we know that microbes now can travel the world, mutate, and wreak havoc. Now, there is a discussion uh, that it might be have been released from a lab, and we don't need to know whether this particular virus was creating in a, created in a lab or not. As you'll see in the 16-minute film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, we introduce gain-of-function research. And there you'll learn about H5N1 avian flu, which has a 52% death rate. And genetic engineers made it airborne in a laboratory. It's very hard to contract this H5N1 avian flu. In a decade, less than 1,000 people have caught it because they were hanging around birds uh, grown in, in um, bird farms for a long time. But scientists made it airborne, which means theoretically it might create a devastating pandemic that can decimate the human population if it escaped. But if you think about biosecurity levels three and four, you might think of them as fortresses that are invulnerable. But over a thousand accidents have occurred and been reported, let alone perhaps many more that have been unreported. There have been releases accidentally of some of the most dangerous pathogens. And so what we've decided to do at Protect Nature Now and GMO 2.0 is to call on not just the ban of the release of genetically engineered microbes, but a ban on the gain of function enhancement of potentially pandemic pathogens. And this, if we just do the ban of gain of function, it's not implementing the lessons that we know about what microbes can do. Because if we release a well-meaning, apparently beneficent microbe, in the environment, it could lead to a pandemic. It could lead to an increase in any one of a number of existing diseases. So we need to be careful in this regard. And because the pandemic has now created a, a global call for greater caution, we can ride that wave and help block all genetically engineered microbes. So this is ultimately an invitation to transform humanity. Many people have had the experience <clears throat> of being diagnosed with a life-threatening disease, and when they pull through, <clears throat> they acknowledge that that disease turned out to be one of the greatest blessings of their lives. And this is the, something that can happen to humanity. We are in a life-threatening situation. <clears throat> We're in a situation where genetically engineered microbes, which can be created by anyone in their basement, could threaten the continuity of humanity and of any living being. And we have just been through a pandemic. We're primed, our receptor cells are open. We need to redefine ourselves now that we have the potential to destroy all living beings. We need to <clears throat> become stewards of nature, to protect the gene pool as if life depended on it, which it does. We need a global vision where everyone holds nature close to their hearts. So it's like a leap forward in collective consciousness. And I understand collective consciousness to be nonlinear and nonlocal, and that leaps forward are possible. And it takes a certain number of people to have that vision and to act according to that vision. And that is why I'm asking you to join the GMO 2.0 movement. We need the most influential, most creative, most brilliant, and most caring people. Please go to responsibletechnology.org and sign up to be part of our list. Go to our Facebook page. Become part of our movement. And we will give you opportunities to reach out to elected officials, to share assets on your social media. 
We'll give you new information and training. People who would like to become more active locally will be providing those things. We're, built, we're in the movement building stage now. The number one most important thing that we can use is financial support. So at responsibletechnology.org, please go to the donation tab and make a recurring donation of any amount that you can afford per month. Because then we will know we'll have that money to count on when we hire people and invest in a particular film or TV series or travel or project. So please join us as a member of the GMO 2.0 movement and if you can, as a contributor. <music>